Welcome back to um, our learning block D, our fourth mini lecture for this week. This uh, this lecture is about managing risk, um, managing transportation risk, and managing other kinds of risk in the global supply chain, whether it's transportation risk or any other risk. The steps are pretty much the same. Um, the whole the whole key to this thing is to is to accept the fact that risk is a fact of life for any supply chain, and there's always going to be some element of risk. So this is what we is what we want to do. We want to we want to take a look at this as it pertains to what we're uh, to pertains to transportation management. We'll throw some examples in. Same time. So risk is a fact of life. It is something that you cannot avoid. It is out there. It is something that you should take uh, as the question is when will it will happen, not whether it will happen. Whether it will happen is a crisis, uh, which may affect. Um, the continuity of your business if you don't get ahead of this. Um, and the more global you are, the more that, that is the case. So these are uh, generally considered to be the top um, risks that are out there uh, by most of the research. This is kind of how they categorize them in these, in these, these situations. Um, if you don't know what a black swan is, uh, you need to go find out what a black swan is. So if somebody uses that term, you know what it is. Uh, the other way to look at it is to look at it as domestic risk, look at it as international risk, and look at it as uh, disasters. And disasters, of course, are weather and natural disasters. That's what we're talking about here, like this. Uh, domestic and international risk, you can put these subjects in both sides of the of the uh, table, if you will. I mean, there's there's, there's supplier performance risk, both domestic as well as international. There's safety risk, both places, quality, same places, security. Regulatory is is generally um, uh, would be considered more of an international risk. So uh, we have the pol we have the policy and certainty issues, um, uh, and all the other and these other things that kind of go into it. So um, this is generally a, kind of a, a, a an overarching uh, snapshot of risk, what risk is. When you're in the global side, um, you have even higher levels of risk. You have risks on both sides. They're different, of course, but um, in terms of, of uh, perhaps um, certainly lead times you would think would be different. So your, your, your time to respond may be actually less. Uh, you may actually have more inventory in the global supply chain than you do in the domestic supply chain. Um, that came to forefront when uh, GM had to shut down because their parts suppliers here in the States couldn't supply parts. So uh, that kind of didn't work, did it? I'm not saying it would have worked internationally either, but it, it certainly didn't work. So when you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with global supply chains, you're dealing with longer lead times, you're dealing with supply chain disruptions, transportation disruptions that occur because of the number of handoffs just in the process itself. I mean, you have all the handoffs from uh, the point of origin to the port, from the port, you have all the customs and foreign regulations and documentations and, um, and, uh, and uh, booking that, that, can, that takes place on uh, either ocean or air uh, on the, when it arrives uh, at the port of entry. You have the same kind of thing. You have customs and the regulations of the of the uh, arrival country. Uh, you potentially run into port congestion. There's port congestion in many ports right now, uh, as business has picked up, activity has picked back up. Uh, there's even one port in Thailand that's looking to actually um, unload on a uh, virtually a floating raft, and then use feeder vessels to move things back and forth. It's a uh, it's quite an interesting thing because they're, they're so congested with product. Um, you have the governmental actions which come about because of, of policy uncertainties, and uh, we've certainly seen that uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, six months. Uh, some of which was, of course, inherited from previous administrations. But nonetheless, we have we have this uncertainty, we have this instability that's out there. Is, is Congress going to pass an infrastructure law? Is Congress going to pass a tax reform? Uh, what are they going to do? Are they going to, uh, you know, do we make the investment? Do we not make the investment? Um, we already spoke about currency fluctuations. We've spoken about unstructured data flows. The more extended your supply chain is, the more 
vulnerable you are to unstructured data flows. If that unstructured data flow is coming from a key supplier that's got intellectual property associated with it, uh, or a weak, uh, or a weak uh, cyber system security situation, then hackers could very easily find their way uh, in through that um, and into your mainframe, and it'd be too late by the time that you um, identified that. So uh, a good example of that, just to give you an example, is the uh, is the hack a couple of years ago from on Target. Um, it turned out that the hack on Target was not a hack on Target specifically. They got to Target through a tier two supplier in Asia. So they were able to obtain data that the uh, Target's tier one supplier had sent the tier two supplier and they were able to navigate their way back into Target's mainframe and steal um, personal data and credit card data. You remember how big a deal that was? Well, that, that attack occurred in the extended supply chain. So it didn't occur in, uh, in Minneapolis. So these are, these are some of the things that are taking place right now, but certainly the cybersecurity side has really, really raised awareness. So this is a great, great opportunity to step up and say, hey, this is what I think we ought to do. So this is a, this, what I'm showing you now is some uh, data from uh, University of Tennessee. Um, and when they looked at roughly 800 companies, uh, what they looked at, they got this, they got this bar chart that shows you uh, the ranking of those 800 countries, companies uh, by each of those, uh, by each of those various um, uh, categories. So you have quality number one, um, and I can tell you this is a big one, particularly in global supply chain. Um, I've had experience with this before uh, with some of our reverse logistics customers where uh, a tier two supplier, even a tier three supplier, uh, the quality of that assembly or that part was not checked and it caused a recall of the product uh, in the market. So it was actually in the market, um, in the stores, and had to be called back because of a tier uh, tier two or tier three supplier assembly that was not checked uh, along the supply chain in Asia. So that was a very expensive problem, it had incurred a lot of transportation expense and distribution logistics expense. And of course, it just screwed the market for them uh, big time. Um, they, they had a competitive uh, product out there that they wanted to uh, uh, to introduce their solution to it, which was quite a bit less than uh, the competitor's product. And uh, unfortunately, they got a black eye. So inventory, of course, is a risk. Are we gonna get rid of it? We have to pay for it. Are we gonna get rid of it? Are we gonna move it? Are we going to have to hold more? Or what are we going to have to do? Natural disasters, um, certainly depending on where you are, that's clearly a risk. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Location here, uh, you're not, we're not too worried about the seas flooding here in St. Louis, but if you were in New Orleans, you'd be worried about flooding. Uh, we worry about flooding, but not like that, like we're gonna go underwater, um, which they are projected to do in uh, the next 30 years or so. Um, the economics, which is a policy side of it, and on and on and on, but look at here. So here you have transit loss, here you have cybersecurity, which is a supplier relationship issue, um, right here, here you have customs as a um, as a uh, supply chain risk. Terrorism includes piracy, so this is a supply chain transportation risk, transportation risk, transportation risk, transportation risk, um, and transportation risk. Because you can buffer your inventory by using uh, other forms of, of transportation to get it there and maintain your inventories at low levels, as you all know. All right, so what the, what the finding is, is that there's very few companies that have formal documented processes for this. And so until a crisis occurs, as I just spoke about, very the companies in general don't put this on the priority list. Um, but the key thing is, is that if you're in the supply chain arena, in the logistics arena and the transportation side of it, you're in the center of the storm. Uh, there, you should not assume otherwise. Uh, something has to happen, something has to happen today. Unload the truck, unload the ship, do this, do that, find some other way of doing it. You know, this is, this is what happened when Hanjin, uh, the ocean liner Hanjin went out uh, last year. Uh, there were uh, 600,000 containers with, crisp, with holiday goods on them that didn't get where we were supposed to get to. 
and then they didn't get back. So there, this is there mass chaos in the market. Uh, Maersk just the other day were hit by a cyber attack, and it took them several weeks to get all of their ports back up, all their operations back up. TNT, same way in Europe. Uh, TNT is a FedEx company. They got hammered by a European cyber attack and and couldn't function operationally. So these things happen, and transportation is at the center of the storm. There's no question about it. Always the center of the storm. So when that happens, then the research shows that um, financially the companies truly truly suffer because one now your your customers know they're not ready. They don't have a plan. They don't know what to do. They don't they don't have any way of mitigating the risk and I'm not gonna ship with them anymore. So there you go. Uh, it can be that simple or it can be any variation of that, but there's no question that companies suffer from disruptions. So their ability to get back up, which we call resilience, which then uh, uh, leads to business continuity, that is getting your business back up and having in place the resilience tools to get your business back up uh, is what this is all about. So even though we can't eradicate risk, we can identify it. We can identify it, we can assess it, we can quantify it, and we can mitigate it. And that's what you need to do. So this is what we're gonna talk about. There's, there's different kinds of risks. There's a risk that occurs every day. Um, you have something happen, you have a competitor reaction, you have a customer demand change, you have a delay, uh, a truck doesn't get there where it's supposed to get there. Uh, that can be bad, I can tell you that from experience. If your truck, if you have an appointment at Menards and you don't show up, you get a fine. Now Walmart saying, if you show up early, you get a fine. If you show up late, you get a fine. So get ready for those of you who uh, do deal with those guys, uh, get ready because your, your phone's gonna ring um, one way or the other and, and you're liable to make your way to the corner office, as they say. And then there's things that you can't, necessarily plan on, but there's things that you can do. For example, you can have plans in place like a tsunami does as a hurricane. Well, Walmart and Lowe's and Costco and all those guys know how to plan for hurricanes. And they have groups of people who watch the weather. And if they see this happening, they have a plan, a process that kicks in right away uh, to make sure that they have inventory positioned um, to help their customers. And they're, it's remarkable what they do uh, with that. But they're very good at it, and people expect it now. So if they didn't do it, uh, they'd buy with the other guy because it would irritate them. Okay, so why is it that most companies are so apathetic about this? Because, because from the supply chain side and the transportation side, we know it's going to happen, and we know we need to identify that risk and we need to go through the steps of a formal uh, or informal organizational process review in terms of where is it and then come up with the answers to, to, uh, to uh, mitigate it. So the twist here is, is you have to document the process, you have to have facility backup plans, supplier backup plans, supplier risk, and you have to have mitigation strategies. So this obviously takes time and takes commitment on the part of uh, the company to do all this. But it doesn't have to be horribly complicated, uh, as I'll show you in just a minute. So this is a this is what we call the this is a four this is from the supply chain risk management group. And this is what they call the four stage supply maturity risk model. So it starts with a digital map. And we're going to look at a digital map in just a second. So this gives us visibility to the supply chain and where these nodes are and where this level of risk is based upon the company's assessment of what that is. Okay, so it requires a lot of financial data or volume data or margin data or, or you know, whatever, um, but it requires a lot of data to build, that, to build that map. And then we have to say, well, what's the chances of it happening? Um, if you're in a, uh, maybe if you're in China and you have a lot of state financing and the state pulls the plug on you, what are you gonna do? So you may have more risk there. Um, uh, than you would otherwise. Uh, if and then the resiliency, which is basically uh, how do we how do we uh, uh, how do we uh, mitigate it, and then how do we how do we maintain it? So um, I like stoplight charts. I think they're very clear. Everybody understands them. So I like the concept of a 
three tier. Um, and you know, this is this is kind of a way to look at it in terms of where to go. So this is the the new supply chain risk model is something you might be able to use in discussions you have. Digital mapping is digital mapping, and we're not going to talk about. We talk about nodes because uh, digital nodes is where we're going to see uh, is the term. So nodes is what we talk about. We talk about the nodes. And nodes are suppliers, their ports, their warehouses, their plants, their uh, their their uh, uh, terminals, their whatever they are. Um, and you're looking at mapping the major lane flows and all the major activity between um, what's going on. So between all this, uh, this volume between your contractors, your warehouses, your DCs, what's your customer doing, all the way through, all the way to the end. And then you connect all those and you look at volume, margin, service, service issues, um, and then identify those risks, uh, quantify those risks, and the probability of those risks that gives you your weighted number and then color code it. And then from there, it looks like this if you do that. So this is a very simple model right here. Okay, this is uh, just two products or two buyers or whatever, and you have very limited people uh, involved in it. And uh, you have a little crossover here. You may wanna have a crossover here or one up here. You know, this may be the risky one died down here, what does it say? single point of convergence right there. So everything kind of comes down here to this to this right here, to this supplier. And then you have this supplier, which is uh, you, you need to do something about it. So anywhere you have these convergence points, you know you have a, a risk level. And so what you want to do is try to understand what that, what that probability or predictability of that risk is. Um, and you never know where it's going to come from. I, I, you know, I assure you, General Motors did not know they were going to have to shut down their manufacturing plants because domestic U.S. domestic suppliers of automobile parts couldn't keep up with their volume. But they did. They had to. They didn't have any parts, so they shut down. But so it's not necessarily an international issue. It's an issue everywhere. So here's another really straightforward map. This is tells you the same kind of thing. And uh, again, you put your numbers on it. These are very simple examples, but they but they're more than adequate for probably the majority of companies to do something like this. But then there's these guys, and these guys they have they have 300 suppliers in China who they have uh, several hundred suppliers in Europe who ship to China who merge with this. They have these guys who merge with this, and over Foxconn does it over here, uh, down in Guangdong, and then stuff goes back, and then it comes this way, and then it goes that way. So you have all of these activities that are taking place here, um, and it can be mapped. There, there's, there's tools out there that can map it. Um, there are apps that can help you map it. There are consulting companies that can help you map it. Or you can do a very simple um, uh, process map like this. And again, it depends on the complexity. For, you can do this by product. You could do this by however. But if you're going to do by product, you want to make sure you focus on uh, the so-called A items. Uh, at least first, and uh, to make sure that you've got your majority of your stuff covered. So th th this is, um, it gives you an idea, but the strategies are all the same, okay? Map it, identify it, assess it, predict it, mitigate it. So this is, this is what we're all saying. And keep in mind that what, where we are today is, may not be where we are tomorrow. And I think right now in the environment we're in, uh, that that is more true than it has been in in recent years. Um, so this has to be something that, that's ongoing. It's something that virtually, uh, th this is why it needs to be either a formal organization or an informal organization. It doesn't matter as long as there's uh, a team tasked with looking at this. And you know maybe it's a morning meeting or a morning meeting every other day or twice a week or whatever it might be, but what's happened in the marketplace certainly if you need to have a meeting you call a meeting you don't wait till the next meeting uh so certainly certainly you just need to you need to stay on top of this and somebody has to be tasked to stay on top of this and this is a big job so this involves a lot of people could involve a lot of people um and a lot of time but if you don't do it the risks the research shows the risks are quite extensive now we spend more time talking about this in 3776 which is more of a risk management class uh, this is just to kind of give you a baseline understanding of what it is that we do uh, what's taking place here we do get more into it um, uh, in in the 3776 class which 
um, you might want to look into with your advisor. So uh, this is the end of this one. We're going to stop here and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the last one for this module, which is on organizations. Back in a minute.